It's The Real News. I'm Aaron Maté. This year's Nobel Peace Prize is being awarded to the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, or ICANN. The group played a critical role in pushing through the first ever global treaty to ban the possession of nuclear weapons. The UN General Assembly approved it over the opposition of nuclear powers earlier this year. And now, dozens of countries have signed on since ratification began last month. Rick Wayman is the Director of Programs and Operations at the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. Welcome, Rick. Your reaction first to the Nobel Prize uh, going towards this effort. Well, thanks for having me, Aaron. Uh, th this is a huge honor for hundreds of activists around the world that are a part of ICANN. Uh, ICANN is made up of over 450 partner organizations in 100 countries. So, uh, you know, this is not some uh, small effort that, that only a few people are undertaking. Uh, th this is massive, this is global, and it's a really exciting movement to be a part of. So, uh, to be honored in this way by the Nobel Committee, uh, it, it's really fantastic and really gives all of us around the world a lot of encouragement to keep at it, make sure this treaty enters into force, and, and really to make sure that the name of the campaign is fulfilled uh, to abolish all nuclear weapons worldwide. So this treaty, let's talk about it. It was passed earlier this year uh, by something like 122 nations at the UN General Assembly. Now it's in the ratification process. Dozens of countries have signed on. But it was not an easy road to get there. So can you tell us how it was achieved? Well, this was a really fantastic partnership between civil society, between a, a lot of non-governmental organizations that are a part of ICANN, and even those that are not a part of ICANN, uh, really influential institutions like the International Committee of the Red Cross, as well as a number of dedicated non-nuclear countries. Uh, some of the leading countries involved in this were Austria, Mexico, New Zealand, uh, South Africa, Brazil, uh, Nigeria, many others as well. Uh, so this was, uh, again, this was not just something that, uh, that a few people thought of and, and moved forward. This is something uh, that, that took a lot of work and, and took a lot of different parts of societies to come together and make it happen. Right. Let's talk about the other side of this. The major nuclear powers, including the U.S. and Russia, were not so happy about this measure, and they came out against it pretty early. Uh, they sure did. Uh, they, the U.S. in particular uh, was very opposed to this idea even under the Obama administration. Uh, back last October, when the U.N. General Assembly was debating the resolution on uh, going forward with these negotiations, um, the Obama administration's team was actively uh, not only speaking out against it in the General Assembly, but also uh, lobbying very hard with their allies uh, around the world to oppose it as well. Uh, that opposition continued when uh, Donald Trump took over, and, um, and, and we've seen that ever since. Uh, the U.S. has been very actively opposed, uh, as have all the nuclear-armed countries, to one extent or another. Uh, the U.S., U.K., and France have uh, particularly been outspoken about their opposition. Uh, but none of the nine nuclear-armed countries were involved in these negotiations. And up to this point, uh, they, they have all steadfastly refused to, uh, to identify the, the treaty as a good thing and, um, and definitely have said that they're not going to sign on. Uh, but that was, the, that was the idea to begin with. Um, we, we didn't expect the nuclear-armed countries to want to come along right away. Uh, you know, this is a process that has happened before with other classes of weapons. And uh, once the treaty went into effect, once that international legal norm uh, became, uh, became part of international law, uh, the, the countries that were, um, that were in opposition to it uh, came along, and, and eventually uh, many of them have signed on. Uh, chemical weapons, landmines. Uh, are just two examples of, of how that process has worked. Let me ask you, you mentioned the nuclear states being opposed to it, but isn't it true that at the beginning there were signs in, from North Korea that North Korea might even be open to it? Well, there were, there were a few votes that it took to get to the point of actually negotiating the treaty. 
And one of the votes was in uh, the UN First Committee, uh, which is, meets in October every year in New York. And last year at the First Committee, North Korea voted in favor of the resolution to uh, begin these negotiations. Uh, then when the full General Assembly went to vote on it, uh, North Korea no longer was voting in favor of it. And, um, and North Korea also was not present at the negotiations themselves earlier uh, this year in, in 2017. Um, but, but yeah, there were some early signs and um, I don't know what happened. I don't know the story behind it. Um, but I, I do have to say uh, to at least their, their small bit of credit, uh, at the beginning, they, they did seem willing to, uh, to listen or to allow the process to move forward. It's just important to keep in mind as we have this unfolding nuclear uh, standoff now with President Trump and Kim Jong-un uh, to it suggests some possible diplomatic alternatives to what we're currently seeing. Um, the nuclear armed states, one of their arguments that they've made is that the existing process is sufficient, including the NPT, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Your thoughts on that? Well, the Non-Proliferation Treaty has been in effect since 1970. So, uh, we, you know, we're, we're well over 45 years into that treaty. And um, there has there's been no meaningful progress on disarmament. Uh, perhaps one could argue that uh, that treaty has been effective in terms of non-proliferation. To a large extent, it has. But Article 6 of the Non-Proliferation Treaty requires all parties to negotiate in good faith for an end to the nuclear arms race and for nuclear disarmament. Uh, that Article 6 obligation has definitely not been fulfilled by the nuclear arms states. Uh, but the, the article applies to all countries, regardless of whether or not they possess nuclear weapons. So we are very happy to see this good faith multilateral negotiation process that resulted in the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Uh, for a lot of countries, that was one uh, really concrete way for them to uh, fulfill or at least partially fulfill their Article VI uh, obligations. Hmm. You know, I want to hone in on what you're saying there about the obligations of the NPT because it's important. I mean, A, uh, nuclear countries are supposed to share in the peaceful uh, um, benefits of nuclear power at least under the terms of the uh, agreement, with non-nuclear countries. And as you say, they're also supposed to uh, not proliferate. But that's been quite the opposite, except especially the US, Russia, and China have expanded their arsenals uh, since the NPT was signed in the 70s. And on this point, I want to ask you about a study that was in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists back in uh, March. And it talks about what uh, the study calls, quote, the revolutionary increase in the lethality of submarine-borne U.S. nuclear forces. And they talk about this as a major threat to uh, stability and to um, the idea of, uh, the, the supposed idea upon which nuclear weapons are based, which is that they're mutually deterrent. Um, and they write, quote, uh, the U.S. increase in the, the increase in the U.S. arsenal has increased, quote, the overall killing power of existing U.S. ballistic missile forces by a factor of roughly three. And it creates exactly what one would expect to see if a nuclear armed state were planning to have the capacity to fight and win a nuclear war by disarming enemies with a surprise first strike. And they add, quote, this vast increase in U.S. nuclear targeting capability, which has largely been concealed from the general public, has serious implications for strategic stability and perceptions of U.S. nuclear strategy and intentions." Unquote. Rick, can you explain for us what the study authors are talking about there? Uh, well, they are, uh, they are scientists, and I'm not. Um, so, you know, I can, I can try to explain it a little bit from a layman's perspective, uh, which is uh, that the U.S. has introduced something called the uh, superfuse on their submarine-launched missiles. Uh, and basically what that does is it greatly increases the accuracy of a nuclear-armed missile 
that we could uh, fire off from one of our many nuclear armed submarines that uh, crawl around the world's oceans. And so, um, you know, back prior to the superfuse, uh, the nuclear war planners believed uh, that they needed perhaps three missiles on one target uh, just to, to make absolutely sure that they hit it uh, with enough certainty to destroy it. With the superfuse, they're able to uh, to shrink the, um, you know, the, the level of um, inaccuracy that they might uh, predict from each missile. And so therefore they don't need to target uh, as many physical missiles on uh, whatever it is that they're targeting. So that is one of the main reasons why we can see the total number of nuclear weapons in the U.S. arsenal, uh, similar for, uh, for Russia as well. But it's, it's why we can decrease the quantity of nuclear weapons that we have while still uh, in the minds of the nuclear war planners not give up any of our kill capability. Uh, so, so one of the main arguments that we hear from the United States in particular is that our arsenal is 85% smaller than it was in the mid 80s, uh, you know, at, at the height of the nuclear arms race. So on the one hand, that's true. Quantitatively, we have fewer nuclear weapons than we did 30 years ago. And that's a good thing. Uh, you, you know, the, the fewer we can have, that's greater. But uh, what we see happening simultaneously is a qualitative improvement in the ones that we have, uh, therefore making it more dangerous uh, in terms of theoretically making nuclear weapons more usable in the minds of military planners. Uh, and we know that nuclear weapons are unacceptable under any circumstance. Uh, there's no question from a humanitarian perspective that any use would, would just be an absolute catastrophe. So uh, we're very concerned that this, uh, this qualitative nuclear arms race is underway. And it's something that we're working very hard to stop, uh, both here in the US and worldwide. If the treaty is ratified, that's just at the UN General Assembly level, right? So it doesn't have the sort of uh, uh, binding authority that, say, a UN Security Council measure would. So what could it actually do towards the goal of uh, reducing or eliminating nuclear weapons? Well, one of the big criticisms uh, that, that uh, countries like the United States will level at the, uh, this current prohibition treaty is that it won't, the treaty itself will not eliminate a single nuclear weapon from the world. One of the reasons for that is that the nuclear armed states aren't signing on. Um, but one really important thing that this treaty will do for any country that signs on, it, it, will, prevent, uh, it will prevent those countries from assisting in the development and manufacture of nuclear weapons. Uh, we believe that that prohibition includes financing. So banks, financial institutions that are involved in financing the corporations that produce nuclear weapons, both here in the U.S. and in other countries around the world, will either no longer be able to do so or will be um, acting against the law if they continue to do so. Um, as we know, uh, with, with all forms of war, uh, nuclear war in particular, money is a big driving factor. And if we, can, uh, if we can take that profit incentive away, make it clearly illegal for, for many financial institutions to be involved in it, then, then that's great. That's going to help the cause a lot. And, and that's something that we're particularly excited about. Rick Wayman, Director of Programs and Operations at the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, thank you. All right. Thanks, Aaron. And thank you for joining us on The Real News.